I want to thank uh, Reverend Nairote, my friend and our colleague and friend for joining in leadership of worship today. And I want to thank Jamie Bob and the Summer Choir for coming together and the beautiful music you are bringing to us today. It's uh, a big week for us. We turn from the glorious preaching and presence of our Gladden lecturer and preacher, the Reverend Dr. Yvonne Delk, Mother Delk, uh, and we return to this time. It is good to be back together again. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Every epic story begins with a small story of change. This week's gospel passage contains two small stories that are woven together into one story about faith rising through awakening and enlightenment. Both stories involve women in crisis. In fact, we don't know them by their names, but their needs. We know them not by their names, but by their needs. What we know is they are both daughters of Abraham. These nameless women are both objectified by taboos around the mysterious power of life, blood in one case, and the loss of breath in the other, the loss of life itself, seeming completely incontrollable in this story. Throughout time, there have been those who have believed that bleeding women and dead girls should not be touched at the risk of conveying their uncleanness to others. These women are victims of this mentality. You see, most people in most societies seek to avoid pain and stay away from blood and death and anything that comes close to that in their lives. But Jesus is not one of those people, and he expects us to never be one of those people. Let's look more closely at these two stories. As you know, the number 12 is very significant in Jewish and Christian thought. For example, the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of Jesus. So it's no coincidence that our first woman has been bleeding for 12 years. She has been cut off from life for 12 years and that the younger woman, the very young woman, is 12 years old. Richard Swanson in his commentary on Matthew says about blood, these things, he says, the place that God's first breath is understood to inhabit a human being is the place also from which we give life back. He finds it intriguing that the word flow can also be translated as river. And like the river, this woman's life has been swept along by conditions that persist for far too long, for far too many years in her life. However, perhaps a better word for her is tired, and I prefer utterly exhausted. A flow of blood for 12 years would utterly exhaust any human being, as this woman's life force has been draining away day by day. She is tired of the physical pain and discomfort, and worst of all, that she's tired of the ever-growing feeling of isolation that has come with the uncleanness and all of the taboos established around it. And yet Jesus ignores all of this. He ignores the uncleanness. He ignores the taboos for the sake of a relationship with this woman. He doesn't permit the touch of this woman to his robe to remain anonymous. It is not passive healing on Jesus' part. He stops, he turns, he looks her in the eye. He lets himself be sidetracked from hurrying to the synagogue leader's home long enough to find who this person is that has reached out to him to touch him. And more specifically, more intentionally, she has gone through the crowd to be that close to him. While the crowd is mostly focused on getting close to a celebrity, this woman was reaching out to touch him to save her life. Jesus feels both her weariness, her utter exhaustion, and her deep sense of hope. He cannot and will not walk away. He needs to meet her. He needs to know her. He needs to see her face to face. 
as power has gone out of him and into her, he needs to know who this was. But at the point of discovery, he doesn't take a lot of time to linger. He's pulled away to the other daughter of Abraham, who's also in great need. This other nameless woman is a very young woman, just 12 years old. That means that the older woman, the nameless woman in the story, who starts the story, has been suffering as long as this little girl has been alive. Although her father calls her his little girl, she's almost ready to begin adult life, ready in her own turn to produce life through children. Remember, as Jesus did, that his own mother was 13 when she got pregnant and 14 when she gave birth to him. And we need to remember that in Jesus' time, 60% of those who survived birth died by their early teens, 60%. So this young woman is about to become a statistic and Jesus will have none of that. Jesus will not allow that to happen. An unknown illness has struck her down, driving her father to extremes. He is desperate for help. He is the only one in this story who has a name, Jarius which means, by the way, he who will be awakened, he, will, he who will be enlightened. Jarius is a religious leader with a certain measure of prestige. He's respected in the religious community and accustomed, no doubt, to being listened to by people who are below him, who don't have his knowledge and don't have his power. But now he is down low. He is on his knees because his precious daughter and her illness has weakened him too. On his knees he begs this traveling folk heal hero and healer as a last ditch effort to prevent the worst thing from happening. He is risking his reputation by going to a traveling healing man like Jesus. He's that desperate. He'll do anything to save his daughter. And Jesus is mocked. Jesus is mocked. He is laughed at as he enters the home to heal this man's daughter. There, ignoring the laughter in his face, he enlightens Jairus and he awakens his daughter. He takes her hand and he calls her to rise. She who was pronounced dead by all those who didn't know or certainly didn't believe in Jesus, is now walking around her former death room. She is risen. Do you see this? The daughter is awakened and Jairus is enlightened. The awakening and enlightening themes that run through these two stories of women rising are not unlike the themes that run through the entire Gospel of Mark. Jesus does but more than that, he, he does more than he says. Jesus' short, shortest sermon is delivered to Jairus in this passage, do not fear, only believe, five words. He preaches with his actions. He shows others, not by telling them about what the reign of God looks like, but by doing things. He heals and he brings grace and he brings hope to every human he encounters. He does this with faith. Faith that is exceptional to what the, do the doctors can bring, he heals with faith. Faith always rises. If you allow faith to awaken you and enlighten you, you will rise too. So which will it be? Will it be faith or no faith? Will it be faith or fearfulness? Will it be faith or confusion or hard-headedness or maybe even hard-heartedness? Faith trumps no faith every time. Faith trumps fearfulness every time. Faith trumps confusion and hard-headedness and hard-heartedness every single time. Faith always wins. It wins over the enemies of faith if it's given a chance to enter the arena of life. I love the expression, fear knocked, faith answered, no one was there. Fear knocked, faith answered, and no one was there. Think about that. When faith answers fear, Fear disappears. Do not fear, Jesus says, only believe. This five-word sermon was just not what Jairus was expecting, but it was not just for Jairus either. It was for the early church. 
Mark addressed them by saying, do not fear, but believe, for it is for each one of us now, each one of us who suffers from the human condition of needing to be in control, those of us who have trouble facing our own vulnerabilities, do not fear, have faith, only believe. The narrative is so sparse, and we wonder what's going on in the minds of those in the story. The synagogue leader, both worried and, and hurried. Jesus, the ultimate multitasking healer, who might have had other plans for the day, but dropped everything to do what was right. Now the father is in distress. The disciples, who are struggling to keep up, they're always struggling to keep up. And the crowds, who are watching all of this and hoping for something great to happen, just a good show would be nice. Something much greater would be even better. And of course, there are the two nameless women who rise from suffering, one bleeding to death and one who is breathless. Two women rising will change the world. Two women rising who, like rising women before them, can do amazing things. The Syrophoenician woman in chapter five, seven, excuse me, the poor widow in chapter 12, the anointing woman in chapter 14 of Mark, all of these are positive role models of what Mark's gospel contrasts with the 12 disciples who are stumbling around the entire gospel, never getting who Jesus is or what he means. But these rising women get him. They get Jesus. Then they go out and they embody him. They embody his compassion, his presence, his healing, his love, his grace in the way they serve beyond those healed moments. If you don't believe me, Listen to Jesus. In Eugene Peterson's The Message, we have this, translations, uh, this translation of Jesus' words to the first woman he heals. Daughter, he says, you took a risk of faith, and now you're healed and whole. Live well, live blessed, be healed of your plague. Faith risks, and women rise. And once they have risen, they change the world. Some of you are wondering, what does this have to do with ending poverty in America? The title of the sermon. And some of you may have even come to hear this sermon, so here we go. First, we don't get to end poverty in America unless we have faith. We need to follow Jesus, who steps into the midst of blood and death and calls us to do the same. He calls us to be the miracle workers of our time, the transforming agents of our time, transforming the world's systems in which nameless tens of millions of people live in poverty, hopelessness, and people who are women and men and children have no hope except to rise to new life, and we need to be on that. Jesus shows us that all who are suffering are on God's mind. He refuses to accept that human misery and the human process of forgetting and ignoring and denying all who are ill and all who are dying put one outside God's concern. God never loses sight of those who are hurting. We need to take on that mind and that heart of Jesus. Yesterday, thousands of poor people were joined by faith believers faithful believers and clergy and union members and activists who rallied on behalf of America's poor near the U.S. Capitol, calling for lawmakers to embrace a slate of policies for low-wealth Americans so that their voices may be heard in November as the nation's largest potential swing vote. Their number one demand was to end poverty in America. They presented 17 points to do this, including increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour, adding safe, affordable housing for the 130 million Americans who are poor and living on the brink of being homeless, stopping voter suppression, providing rights for those in the LGBTQIA community, climate change, ending gun violence, and ending hate and division and extreme political agendas. The Reverend Dr. William Barber, 
with whom I co-led a demonstration in March here in Ohio some years ago, and is in my book, The Genius of Justice, co-led the organization, The Poor People's Campaign. And he declared to the sprawling crowd that white, black, Native American, Hispanic Americans, and poor people of every imaginable stripe are to come together to be represented, because they're not represented by both major parties, one of the largest untapped blocks of voting in the country. The People's Campaign, Barber argued, is for all people, people who do not vote their full potential, despite making up 30% of the national electorate and close to 40% of the voters in battleground states. Were the poor to vote with full strength, he said, they could potentially elect lawmakers who support policies focused on things that impact their lives directly. Like the Prophet Moses, honored by Jews, Muslims, and Christians, led the people out of bondage in Egypt, it's time to rise, he said. Like the dry bones in the valley of Ezekiel's vision, we've got to rise. Like the ancient vision of the Prophet, when the stones that the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone of a new reality, we've got to rise. Speakers at the demonstration grappled with two major political happenings that happened this past week. One, a Supreme Court decision upholding bans, barring homeless people from sleeping outside in certain cities. I'm gonna come back to that. I just want us to pause for a second. The Supreme Court of the United States banned homeless people from sleeping outside in certain cities. We need to sit with that one. And the presidential debate between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, they were talking about this. Uh, you know, there had been calls, and some were dubious about the calls for the president to halt his reelection bid in the wake of the widely panned debacle, I mean debate, that happened this last week. It included moments, of course, that we all saw where Biden paused for long periods of time, lost his train of thought, got completely caught up in everything that was happening, stumbled, stuttered, had wrong answers, and of course then his, his opponent in the race, Donald Trump, was just lying continuously. So what are we looking at here? This is nuts. Neither party is proud of this, right? There's an array of issues, though, that impact the poor that are at stake right now, that are at stake right now in America, and they have um, effects that will last forever, okay? Barber, who has life-altering disabilities, was told as a young man not to be a pastor because, and I quote, people won't follow a man who walks with a cane and is bent over. You should just give up on your idea of being a pastor. Well, thankfully, he didn't listen to the disciples of Christ and the leaders there and became a pastor. He suggested that poor performances should not disqualify either person from these <laughs> races. He says, in my tradition, Moses stuttered and he brought down Pharaoh. Jeremiah had lifelong depression, but he stood up for justice. Jesus was acquainted with sorrow. Harriet Tubman suffered from epilepsy. People getting caught up on how a candidate walks. Well, let me tell you, he said, I've had trouble walking all along, but I know how to walk for justice. So that's the key that matters. In politics, there has become a dirty, ugly, open secret that the word poverty is taboo sort of like the woman who bled for 12 years. We can't talk about poverty in America anymore. We saw that displayed the other night, and we've seen it displayed continuously in presidential debates where there's never a question about what's going on with the poorest of the poor, but, but the candidates can talk about golf games instead. We have to get ourselves together here, folks. The Supreme Court's decision was an absolute subject of scrutiny yesterday. The Reverend Liz Thea Harris, blasting the justices' rulers, said that cities cannot, that, that said the cities cannot ban homeless residents from sleeping outside. How can she say that be? 
Does that mean that the highest court has now criminalized homelessness so that you can rule that someone cannot breathe in public, on a bench, in a car, in a park, because they don't have a home? Is that what we're saying? That's insane. We can see that our country is moving that way, the way of no longer caring for people who are most impacted by our nation's poverty. Shelter and housing is a right in this country. We need to make it something that everyone has the right to. You and I know that homelessness is not a crime. We've got to stand up and speak out. It's time to not just go to church, but to leave church and do something about it. It's time to get out and be transformers of the society. And finally, I just want to share, Maria Martinez shared this story. A poor woman living below minimum wage, as she spoke yesterday, told how her whole life has been inf infested and infected by living in rat-infested, toxic environments, which is where the poor in the inner city live. My whole life, she said, I've been running only to find that there is nowhere to run in this country that is not contaminated by the disease of injustice. With her voice wavering with emotion, she said, meanwhile, a three-month supply of my insulin, which is medically necessary for me, retails at $1,600. At the federal minimum wage, someone who has diabetes in America has to work 28 full days full time to afford that only. The child in, in me is upset, she said. It screams, why? And then she looked out at the crowd and she said, I look at all of us today and know that the solution to our problem is right in front of us. We can move this forward together. My friends, poverty is eating people alive in our nation and in our world. We have no illusions of this, and I have no illusions that this sermon is going to end poverty. And aren't you happy to know that? <laughs> but saying nothing and doing nothing won't end poverty either. We need to get out of the church. We need to activate. We need to register voters. We need to turn out the vote. We need to change the law and the law lawmakers who create unjust laws. We need to be healed. We need to be awakened and enlightened and faith-filled people of God who will turn this madness around and not sit on our hands or cry in our coffee about the choices we have for president or the struggles of our lives or the life of the poor. We need to be Christ in this world. We need to be his feet, his hands, his voice, his presence. And this is where the epic story comes back to the simple story. We need to be like he was in that moment on that day with the two unnamed women in Mark's gospel. We need to be about rising and we need to help others rise. We need to fight for justice. We need to spend time in our lives working to save the poor. And when we do, we will be saving the very soul of our nation. Amen.